Hammer and I could we had Zuko. 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 Because they would have done it for me. So the date is August 16th, 2002, and flying over a valley in Afghanistan are two A-10 Warthogs. An A-10 is a heavily armored, low-flying, slow aircraft designed to provide ground cover for troops on the ground. And on this night, it's a very, very cloudy night, the storm's in the area. These two planes hanging up above, just waiting in case anybody down below needs help. Up there, it's gorgeous. The moon is, is bright. There's thousands of stars in the sky. The clouds look like the snow had just fallen. Down below in the valley, however, there were 22 special forces, special operations forces, troops, trying to make their way through the country. And they could feel that something was wrong. They could feel, they felt uneasy. One of the pilots up above, call sign Johnny Bravo, and yes, he stands like this. He could feel their unease listening to them over the radio, so he decides he was gonna go down below the cloud and just have a look. He tells his wingman, hang out up here, I'll go see what there is. And he points his plane down into the clouds. And as he's going through the clouds, the call comes over the radio, troops in contact. Troops in contact is what they say when they come under effective fire. It means they're in trouble. So now Johnny Bravo points his plane straight down. The plane's getting thrashed about in the turbulence. And when he comes out below the clouds, he's less than a thousand feet off the ground, and he's flying in a valley, cliffs on both sides. Now this is only 2002, and the planes were not yet equipped with ground-hugging radar, and worse, they were using old Russian maps. That's all they had at the time. And the sight that greets him is something like he's never seen before, not in training and not in the movies. He sees tracer fire, fire coming from all sides of the valley, pointed right in the middle where the American forces are. And so he picks a point and starts to lay down suppressing fire. And he's flying and he's in danger of hitting the cliff, of course. He knows his speed, he knows his distance from the map, and he literally counts out loud while he lays down the suppressing fire. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. Pulls hard on the stick, pulls back up into the cloud, comes down around again. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000. 
good hits, good hits, it says over his radio. And again, he comes around, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. He runs out of ammunition, fuel is fine. Flies back up to the top of the cloud, tells his wingman, you need to get down there. His wingman isn't sure about the condition, so the two of them fly back down together. His wingman lays down the suppressing fire, and Johnny Bravo counts as they fly three feet apart from each other, wing to wing. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000, up and around again. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. That night, 22 Americans went home alive with zero casualties. My question is, is where do people like Johnny Bravo come from? Who are they? Who would risk their lives for others so that may, they may survive? I asked Johnny Bravo. I asked him, why, why would you do it? Why would you risk your life so that others may survive? And he gave me the same answer that everybody in his position gives. Because they would have done it for me. Because they would have done it for me. Because they would have done it for me.